welcome to MarsCon Reading. I'm Katherine Sullivan. I'm going to be reading two things. One from a short story that's going to be coming out in an anthology supposedly coming out in April. Um, it's an anthology uh, supporting another convention called, called Covard 19, which is focusing more on crows and the related family members. So I have a short story based in a follow-up to Talking to Trees, where the main characters actually appeared in Talking to Trees first. The short story is called Fledging. Jay, Jay! Twigallet started as a shriek blasted over her head. The twig leaf she had been focusing on holding in midair dropped. She looked skyward, but saw no hawk or other winged creature to explain the alarm cry. She lowered her gaze to meet the black eyes of the blue jay watching her from his perch in grandmother's branches. Why? The young jay looked back at her, his blue crest raising and lowering. He fluttered his wings and called softly. Come and see, Twigalit repeated. The telling I sound you? The young bird was the elf wizard's constant companion. She looked around for some sign of the wizard, but not, did not see even her gray cloak hanging from the stub of a broken branch. Twigalit could ask grandmother, but after giving her a lesson to practice, grandmother said she'd be busy with the wizards. Twigala did not wish to disturb her, though grandmother had to be deep in the working to not respond to the noisy jay in her very branches. The jay hopped in one direction along the branch, then back in the other. He muttered something, sounding almost like his wizard, and Twigala wondered why he had to be as cryptic as, as her. She glanced back down at the leaf by her foot, then raised her hands and studied the green of her palms. She'd been so close. She would work on the lesson later. She shook her head and let the clatter of the wooden beads in her hair soothe her. She walked over to grandmother's trunk and began to climb. Birds had been her only friends from outside when Tikalit was growing up. Only they could fly across the wasteland that surrounded her family's land. They had told her stories of other places. Birds had aided her as well in the, her travels to find help when grandmother was ill. They had kept her company and warned of her trouble. This one reminded her of her human friend, always telling her what to do. She reached the branch that Jay perched on. The bird hopped to a higher branch. Twigala climbed to that branch. The Jay hopped flapped to yet another branch, one which was almost too thin for him. She looked sternly at him. It would be faster if you would tell me how high we're going. The Jay balanced unsteadily in the branch. He winded her. In the very top? She had been in the topmost branches of Grandmother before. It had been her favorite spot when she was smaller. Grandmother would help her to climb back then, move, moving branches for foot and handholds. The bird hopped upward from branch to branch, clicking comments to encourage her as she climbed. Yes, this is as fast as I can climb. No, I'm not a fledgling. I left here to find help, and then I returned to fight the life hater. You know that. You were there. The bird clucked and wiped his beak on the branch beneath his black feet. Twigalit wondered what that meant. He hadn't been at the battle, but she had found him waiting with Grandmother when she had returned. She would have to ask Grandmother what he had done. The bird seemed very smug, and that beak wiping usually meant food. Finally, she reached the topmost of Grandmother's branches. She settled herself in her regular spot. The jay perched at the very end of one branch. He looked at her out of one black eye, then turned his head to point out across the lands. Twigala looked where he directed. Out here, when she was small, there had only been desert. Then before she had left grandmother to find help, she had seen a great flood stretching partway across the desert to the horizon. She had learned on her travels that the flood was due to the magic of many of the wise. Now, where water had been, spread the green of a grassland that Talinali had said was called Wingard. She shaded her eyes. There were four-footed beings out there, singly in clump or in clumps with head lowered, all slowly moving in direction. Are those Wingard? she asked the Jay. Are they what you wanted me to see? The bird bounced, making the slender branch sway. He fluttered to another branch in a different direction and whined for her to look. Twigala turned reluctantly. That view looked over the evil one's land. She'd always been afraid to look there. But now others stood without fear atop the long bluff at the start of the wasteland. She recognized some of the wizards she had seen before, when they had all stood together against the life destroyer. She remembered the large gray and white patches of the windkin in the group from the battle as well. There were several gray cloaks there, but only Talinali would hold the long branch grandmother had given. Talinali is there, she said. The jay bounced and swayed. 
Grandmother said the, the wise planned to restore the wasteland as they did Wingard, but first they wanted to examine them. She wished she could listen to the discussion the way Grandmother probably was through the link with her branch in Talinali. Why are you not with them, looking for traps and curses? The Jay called softly and took Tal and took all it straight and indignantly. I need no protection. Grandmother holds this land. The Jay chortled. Stop calling me fledgling. No, I'm not an expert. The Jay flirted his tail and spread it, showing its black and white stripes. He lifted his wings and sprang away from the branch. To a gull that watched as he circled downward. I am not expert, she repeated. Yet. She looked again at those atop the bluff. With Talonali and grandmother occupied, perhaps she could try again with the magic lesson without interruption. Or maybe try something else without their notice. And I'll stop there because I don't think they want me to read the entire story. But I'm going to bring up an Odie. Uh, I have a short story in the Doctor Who short trips. So we're going to get the Doctor Who segment. And this was called The Diplomat Story. Doctor Who short trips repercussions. Um, editor was Gary Russell, who is also. Um, Umsin slowly stirred her Tom Young soup. Des would have complained that it was much blander than him, his made from her mother, her mother's recipe. I saw my tongue stumbling here. Ha! They call this tie, he would have said. Needs more green curry. But Des was gone. Des is dead. She was aware of other conversations swirling about her in the makeshift cafeteria. Formerly the assembly hall, its acoustic could enhance even the softest murmur. The decibel level of conversations after the missile, the aliens' missiles had hit, the outer settlements, needed no such enhancement. The current topic, however, had shifted from the attacks to speculations on the two newcomers. But Amson wasn't interested in gossip at the moment, even if the gossip concerned the two who had stopped the aliens before missile, more missiles had destroyed the colony. Nor was she interested in the discussions of the possible terms of the peace treaty. Once she would have been, and she would have used those discussions later in her classes. But now she could only hear the polite words the Marine had spoken an hour. Was it only an hour ago? I'm sorry, Amson. Des is dead. Des is dead. They had had so many plans for this stage of their lives. She'd retired from teaching only a month ago. Des was set to retire in another three, and they'd moved back permanently to their, their allotment back in the hills and really begin to explore their new home. And perhaps one of their children might leave Earth to join them. Des had been hopeful of that. It's getting too restrictive on Earth. This is their home, and it's a good place to raise our grandkids, he said. But Des was dead. Hunger reminded her to take a spoonful of soup. It was cold. How long has she been sitting here? She slowly grew conscious that the conversations around her shifted again. So the aliens claimed that they attacked because we had killed their people? There were no signs of a colony there when this system was surveyed. We have every right to explore other planets in the system. Bunch of primitive animals. How were we supposed to know that they were intelligent? And how would aliens in a nudist camp demonstrate intelligence if aliens suddenly landed and started killing people? Would you stick around to try to talk to them? Not me. I'd run like hell. They just wanted us. They just wanted us out of the sky. We lost several good people. They must have called for help. There were no signs of the technology that could have produced those ships on that planet. A planet with that many resources and they put a back to nature colony on it? There must be some way we can claim prior rights to it. Excuse me, but we're having a private conversation. Humpson slowly looked up from the soup. Other snippets had passed unheard of so much noise, but not this. She knew that voice. And a hard time you're probably having of it, too, with all these people sitting around you. Down the table, the gray-haired woman sitting next to the delicate wolf's associate shook her head. Never mind, dear. You go right ahead. I'll find some, someone else to pass me the sugar. Or whatever sweetener that is. Wolf flushed, then straightened with the meaningful look that Amson had always, often seen directed at members of the opposition. In her last class, one of her students had started a betting pool as to how many times in a session the look would be used. Do you know who I am? Delegate Wolf asked, raising his voice. 
Heads turned along the table in the sudden stillness. Now he would be familiar with this room's acoustics, Armson thought wearily. A bowl of sweetness was within reach. She pushed it down toward the woman. Thank you. The woman sipped her sweetened drink, blinked, and looked down into her cup. That's not coffee, she remarked. She's one of the newcomers, someone near Armson whispered in a shocked voice. That explained the reaction to the she root beverage, Armson realized. It had taken Amson a few years to adjust to the colony's substitute for coffee. The bitter drink smelled much better than it tasted. Des thought tea was better than marine issue coffee, but not by much. Des is dead. Her eyes filled with tears, and Amson looked down into her soup. Are you all right? Startled, Amson looked up. The woman was standing next to her, looking at Amson with concern. Past her, Amson could see Wolf and his associate watching them. Wolf, obviously angry at being ignored. Are you all right? The woman repeated. No, my husband. Amson took a deep breath and brushed her eyes. Thank you, I'll be all right. I'm Amson Ives. You're new here? Evelyn Smythe. Yes, I'm still finding my way about. This is rather elaborate for a dining hall. Amson smiled. This was our assembly hall before the bar bombardment. She looked about at the carved panels and statues, remembering the colony's excitement and pride in its construction. We decided to be functional with most of the buildings, while here we decided to celebrate our new government. Grandiose, but as Embers has said, when I have seen fine statues and afterwards enter a public assembly, I understand well what he meant, who said, when I have been reading Homer, all men look like giants. Dr. Smythe, there you are. A tall, dark woman appeared behind Evelyn and Amson with a faint shock, recognized by his president. The doctor says he's ready for the next round of talks. She turned to Amson. Mrs. Ives, I'm so sorry for your loss. Amson looked down, struggling to maintain her composure. Andreas Skimp, uh, Andreas Skimp had long ago been one of her students. Although it was pleasant to know Andrea had remembered her teacher, the unexpected symphony, symphony overwhelmed her. Thank you. Evelyn Smythe glanced at the suddenly worried Vice President Skemp, then back at the obviously grief-stricken woman. Where were her friends? They couldn't leave her here like this. And at the same time, they couldn't stay. The doctor needed to hear what Evelyn had learned so far. Deciding quickly, the doctor probably wouldn't notice an additional person. Evelyn asked, Mrs. Eyes, would you care to join us? She glanced qu quickly at the Vice President for support and was pleased to see the young woman agree. Yes, do come, Mrs. Ives. We could use your insight. Skemp met, met Evelyn's eyes and nodded firmly. Insight, Evelyn thought. There's a history there. Wonder what the doctor would, will make of this. The doctor seemed relieved when Evelyn and her party arrived in the chamber. Evelyn, there you are. The defense leader was acting, asking about you. Really? Evelyn turned toward the communication screen. The large brown eyes of the antelope-like being, if said antelope was allowed two arms as well as four legs and antlers, pictured within, studied her. Light glinted off a wide color of metallic interlocking, interlocking, uh, can't talk, interlinking plates. The wide ears flicked forward and the head bobbed, showing the four sharpened points on the antlers. Of course, the defense leader said calmly, negotiations cannot begin without the presence of a matriarch. Oh dear, Evelyn thought. She noticed a sudden interest to those about her as the being spoke. So the doctor did get a translator working. Pity there wasn't one earlier. During their previous session, she had spent most of the time translating for the president and the military. Of course, the doctor agreed. Defense leader, may I introduce Vice President Skemp and... He glanced at Mrs. Ives and raised an eyebrow. Both women were staring at the screen. screen. The shorter woman started at the doctor's introduction. I'm some eyes, she said, putting her hands together and nodding over them to the being on the screen. Evelyn was relieved that the woman was not immediately berating the aliens for her loss. In fact, her face suddenly seemed alive with interest. A great teacher, Skimp whispered proudly behind Evelyn. It's thanks to her that I got into politics. Not a bad idea to bring her along after all, Evelyn decided. She recognized the intent intent look in those dark eyes now that of any teacher facing a new challenge and if she understands politics well enough to interest others so much the better that she's here the defense leader bobbed her head 
ingested another bean into view. I introduced our matriarch, Mihan. The second alien nodded, and Evelyn noticed that although her fur was streaked with patches of silver, the six anchor prongs were still sharp. Jewels sparkled in the harness about her shoulders, which appeared to hold several knives as well. She will speak for our colony on Tuba, as well as the Hufka people. The doctor looked around. Right then, now that we have the introductions done. Evelyn glanced aside at President Henry, but he was conferring with one of his assistants. Skep mo motioned her to a seat right beside e Amson. That's, Evelyn whispered to Amson, starting to point towards the president. Amson smiled. Ted Henry, I know, I taught him too. She turned in dick indulgent luck on him. Always a charmer, that one. She tucked some of her black hair behind an ear and looked back at the screen. Defense leader, would you care to repeat the condition she told Evelyn and myself earlier, the doctor asked? The defense leader lifted her head, her nostrils flaring. First, that the humans return the heads of our colonists that they stole. Evelyn mentally winced, remembering how the defense leader had first described the murders of their colonists. Judging from the conversation she had overheard among the human colonists, colonists, those involved had thought the aliens to be game animals and had taken trophies. Appearances can definitely be deceiving. Second, we have three missing colonists. We demand their return or the return of their bodies. Third, that the humans will turn over those responsible for punishment. We will deal with that, President Henry said. Let me say again, defense leader, how sorry we are about this tragic misunderstanding. Misunderstanding, the doctor repeated. Henry founded him. Well, we will conduct our own investigation first to prove to you, defense leader, as well as ourselves, that the persons involved did not deliberately set out to murder intelligent beings. Predators, Mahet snorted. There's no dealing with them. They kill for sport as well as for food. Best kill them now before they harm us further. She lowered her head, showing the sharp points of her antlers, then turned away. Hold on a moment, Evelyn replied. You can't publish the entire, you can't punish the entire colony for the actions of a few. You said you'd listen. She appealed to the younger alien. Defense leader, you promised the doctor that you would hear what the president had to say. I'm sure he wasn't finished. She turned expectantly towards the president. President Henry nodded quickly. The corporation involved will also be heavily fined and will make some form of restitution to the families of your colonists. His assistant keyed the addition into her pad. And Evelyn prodded. The president spread his hands and spoke to the screen. Beyond that, I can't make any promises. We have laws we must follow. All we ask is that you give us time for investigation. Those involved won't escape. We've already destroyed most of our ships. Mahat leaned forward and conferred briefly with the defense leader. The defense leader looked back at the screen. What form of restitution, she asked. Do you think lives can be replaced? Lives are lost here too because of your tax, Amson broke in. My husband, she faltered, then took a deep breath and continued. My husband was killed today, protecting this colony. Will you turn those responsible for his death over to me for punishment? Should I demand restitution from you? The two aliens studied her. You are a matriarch as well? The defense leader asked. You speak for your colony? Amson glanced at the president, who nodded. Yes, she said. The defense leader turned toward Meha. The doctor whispered to Evelyn, I think you've been upstaged. Then Meha blew out a breath. I respect your death. She turned to the defense leader. You may continue. Negotiations went on for a while longer, and in the end, Evelyn thought both sides benefited. The Hufka military would continue to maintain a presence in the system, looking after its otherwise defenseless colony. The humans would still be allowed ships, and there would be no interference with tr its trade with Earth and other planets, and both colonies would open diplomatic relations. Evelyn thought the doctor was most persuasive on that, pointing out that it would prevent future misunderstandings between Hufko and humans. Finally, the screen was disengaged. Well, to start, President Henry sighed as he leaned back from the table. We're not out of trouble yet, but at least we're not under fire. And we have you two to thank for that. He nodded toward the doctor and Evelyn. Only too glad to help, the doctor replied airily. We'll let the diplomats work out the smaller details. I don't have any of them that, Henry sighed, staring at the screen. You have someone in mind, Skimp asked. The president gestured his assistant. 
Delegate Wolf, for one. He's the most experienced of the delegates, and he's been sending a constant stream of requests to remind me of that ever since the meeting started. Fifteen so far, his assistant confirmed, glancing at her pad. Henry sighed, although how he ever found out that we were, we were in negotiations. Yeah, it was probably my fault, Skemp acknowledged. He was at Mrs. Ives' table when I found Dr. Smythe. Was he? Evelyn asked. Not that white-haired gentleman with a certain manner of looking down his nose? Thompson nodded. The one who thought you should know him. Don't take it personally. He directs the look at many delegates. I don't know, Skemp said wordly. Will the Hoofco accept him? Mrs. Ives? Thompson looked up from gathering her notes. Oh, they'll probably accept a male for representative. They had no problem with the doctor or you, Mr. President, after all. Still, it was apparent they paid more attention to the vice president in Evelyn. They don't seem to be purely a matriarchal society. And although I gather from some things they said that only a female could be a defense leader to speak for them, that could just be their military. Thompson smiled. What an interesting society. Studying the structure of that would be, she searched for a word, challenging, Evelyn suggested. The chance of a lifetime, Thompson agreed. She looked down at her notes again. And then, of course, dealing with their military should be different from their colony leaders. It all depends on how back to nature their leaders are. If they're nomadic rather than territorial, for example. Evelyn had a sudden mental picture of the haughty delicate wolf trotting across the plains in pursuit of the hoof cold colony leaders and had a stiff old smile and mentally frowned. If the hoof call asks for a translation of his name, there'll be that predator bias again. That reminded her of the person seated next to Wolf in the cafeteria, the one who had seemed a bit more knowledgeable about the dust at the Hufco colony, who, if she remembered correctly, had seemed very intent on rights to the planet. Well, we've got them talking, the doctor said softly, coming alongside her time to, he waggled two fingers in an imitation of walking legs, slip away, don't you think? You're leaving, Skip asked, overhearing? Now? Our ship is undamaged, the doctor said, and we seem to have helped stop a potentially devastating war. But now I think you need to make your own decisions. But before you do, Evelyn said, could I make one suggestion about your choice of diplomat? Skip and Henry looked at each other. Please do, President Henry said. Evelyn gestured to Umson. Her. Umson looked up to see them considering her. Me? Oh no, I couldn't. I, I, I wouldn't know where to begin. You saw how the hoof cold looked. Listen to her, Evelyn continued, and it was a well-known practice on earth for teachers to become diplomats. They're better trained to see several points of view. You'd be wonderful, Skimp, assured Omson. That she would be, Henry said thoughtfully. No ties to any lobbies or special interest groups, and I know I can trust you to work with the hoof cold, not to try to control them. Please, Mrs. Ives, you wouldn't let your students down, would you? Uh, just I'll continue one more paragraph. Ted Henry always was a charmer, Amson reminded herself. She looked around the small office, then back at the view through the large window. The vast plain stretched from the border of the small spaceport for Cuba to the foothills of the mountains. Long grasses rippled in the wind. And she considered that if she had four legs, she was sure she'd be tempted to go out there and run. She sighted a twinge in her right knee and reached below the desktop to rub it. Of course, these days, she'd settle for two healthy legs. Don't let yourself grow old, Tabitha, she told her assistant. I'll be fighting it all the way, ma'am, Tabitha replied, not looking up from her pad. How do you want me to respond to this interview request? Now, I guess we'll start there because I don't want to take on too much time. And we've already covered the entire time that the doctor's in this part of the story. So again, this is um, unfortunately... Big Finish has discontinued these books, but at least you get a little taste of my Doctor Who stories. And thank you for coming and listening to this reading and enjoy the rest of Marscon. Thank you.